you've never bought into black inferiority. They may condescend to you. They may try to close a door to you, but it's up to you to accept or reject that. I've discovered that the people who do well in life are the people who learn to manage their challenges well because the challenges are inevitable. Pitfalls of victimization, they're inevitable. There's an infection in the human heart that makes people discriminate and treat each other the way that we do. And it has little to do with skin color. Tracy Arlington, your company is... Play Safe Defense. You know how to play it safe and take care of yourself because you're a black belt in Taekwondo, correct? Correct. Tell me about Play It Safe. What is it you guys set out to do? What's your objective? What's your mission statement? Our mission statement is to teach children how to self-protect, teaching them the ABCs of self-defense, awareness, boundaries, and the chihuahua confidence to set the boundary, Mm -hmm. um, but in an age-appropriate way. So... Uh, We teach kids as as young as four, and of course, we're going to teach them a lot different than we would a teenager, but the kids get that whole concept. If a chihuahua can bark off a big dog, they can too. So their biggest weapon is their voice, and that's what we really want to um, to, uh, teach them to use and set the boundaries. I want to talk about bullying. You, again, have some great, actually hands-on, specific advice for kids to use if they're being bullied at school. So take us through that. Let's assume that we've got a kid that's being tormented, verbally abused at school. We had a young man that was nine years old. He was gay at a school in Denver, Colorado. He was in school for four days and killed himself reportedly because of bullying. And we see this just so often time and time again. I just know If you had worked with this young man before he started school and he had some techniques and skills and abilities, he would be alive today. What do you tell kids that are being bullied? Well, it's two, it's two sided. So, um, with the little ones, we find that it's not as, it's not as much bullying as it is more friendship drama. But then when we, we get into middle school and high school, um, that's probably where we see more of the, the bullying that killed this young man. So um, the Girl Scouts call me the girl whisperer because girl drama is my specialty. And friendship conflict is probably what we see the most. So I would say the majority of parents that bring their kids into our class, it's it's to handle all of that. You're not my friend anymore. Um, you can't play with us because you're not good. Um, I'm better at that than you are. So what we do is we teach them verbal karate. So you punch me with a mean comment. So um, go ahead and tell me I'm ugly, and I'm going to show you the wrong way. All right. You're just an ugly loser. Yeah, whatever. Like, I really care what you think just because you're Dr. Phil. (laughs) See? Well, that really hurts. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So that's the wrong way to handle it, right? Because didn't I just lose my power to you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Sassiness attracts more sassiness. I have this huge poster of a sassy Sasquatch that we tell the kids you don't want to say, so I don't care who cares or whatever. So now we're going to replace those with more powerful responses. So. Yeah, because when you do what you're talking about, then they've poked and you've reacted. And you've responded. They they've got the desired reaction. And they have your power. Yeah, they've gotten right. under your skin, so uh-huh. they've got control. Right. Okay, so. Now, so tell me I'm ugly again. All right, you're just an ugly loser. Oh, that's good to know. Hey, um, how was your summer? Uh, well, you, uh, uh, fine. <laughs> I mean, it, it takes the air out of it. It takes right. the air out of the balloon, right? right? Yeah. So responses like, um, we have an acronym called winner. W, walk away. I, ignore the comment and don't look back. N, no sassiness. Say, okay, sure. Or good to know. Or indeed <laughs> noted. The next N, say something nice, change the subject. E is exit, so don't engage, don't fight. And then the R is report, and that's our acronym. And so we actually role play the kids in the class they have. They go back and forth, so they'll say, you're a baby. And then the other their partner has to say, hey, good to know. And they practice back and forth, back and forth. And then what we also do, though, and which I'm very proud of is uh, about, is that we teach them to resolve conflict with the yo-yo friend. Because that's the number one complaint I hear from the kids. 
one day she's nice to me, the next day she's not. Then she's nice, then she's not. And so we actually talk about the difference between a yo-yo friend and a true friend and how to resolve that conflict with that friend, because that's what I hear the most in elementary school. Then you turn the road and you get to middle school and high school, and that's where we see, you know, uh, more of the, you know, bullying at, at its extreme. Okay. Yeah. So the responses that you want people to give whenever they're name called, marginalized, told they're not good enough, get away, whatever, mm -hmm. give me a list of responses again. Yeah, I'm um, good uh, to know. Yeah. Okay, sure. But, and you have to do it with a smile because uh -huh. if you don't smile, then you look mad, right? Yeah. Um, uh, indeed noted, you know, or, uh, with the littles, like uh, with your granddaughter, tell her if someone says to her, you're not my friend anymore. She should just say, well, you're still my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Little kids are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that to me. You know, just yeah. being nice, changing the subject, okay. but not reacting. In fact, we always say to the kids, it's okay to feel mad or sad. Just don't let a mean kid see my feelings. Keep my power with a kind comment and a smile, even though I feel like hitting them. <laughs> because we're not going to lie to them. That's what they feel like doing, but then they'll lose their power. If they do this with any kind of consistency at all, then that person that's picking on them is going to go find somebody else that's easier to deal with. Someone who's not confident. And that's it yeah. in a nutshell. Do you know, in our class, and I, and I really encourage parents to do this with their children, have your child stand up straight, you know, hands at their side. Because when you put your hands in front of you, that looks shy or weak. Crossing the arms is mad. Um, this is sassy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and it's, But this is what we call confident posture. And I encourage parents to actually practice that with eye contact because that's powerful and the smile. That was mm -hmm. what seals the deal. We tell kids that that's your superhero power is smiling, even mm -hmm. though you don't feel it. Yeah. And eye contact is really important. Really important. And if they have uh -huh. the confidence to do that, it can really help. Right. But again, role playing is very important. Just like you and I just did. If a parent will sit down with their child and role play this, the kids can roll their eyes till the cows come home. That's okay. But if they still go through the trials, they still go through one, two, three, uh -huh. four, five times, they may roll their eyes. And I always tell parents, kids may seem like they're not listening, but they're watching oh, yeah. and they're learning. Yeah. And it may be a day, it may be two, yeah. but that's going to come into play. Yeah, we had a, three school assemblies today. Uh, we had grades K all the way through eighth. And you want to know the middle school kids were taking notes yeah, because they want to know how to deal with, with the drama and also with the bullying and, and how, how to look confident even though they're not feeling it. Yeah. I think sometimes these kids make the mistake of thinking that they always have to be in a relationship with someone. They always have to have that friend there every minute. And I always try to get kids to understand, you know what? If you're alone, you're not a bad person to do it with. I know. I mean, if you like yourself, if you have confidence, and maybe this afternoon you're in the library alone, if you really feel okay about yourself, you're not a bad person to hang out with. Right. Didn't you say you know, that in your book? You said yes, be your best friend? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You've got to be your own best friend. Right, right. And if you really think that, if you can really have that in your internal dialogue where you say, look, so I'm going to spend the afternoon alone. But, you know, I crack myself up sometimes. Yeah. I, you know, I yeah. get along with me fine. You could be like my husband. He's always alone with the dog. Yeah. Oh. It's just him and the dog. Well, <laughs> the man's got to have his dog. It's always. <laughs> so I, I got you. All right. Let's talk about the bullying proper. Okay. Right. So that like more physical bullying. Right. right. Okay. So obviously, I think in middle school and high school, it's getting kids to recognize and we do this with elementary school kids as well, but getting kids to realize what are what what bullying is and what mean be, versus mean behavior. So I'll ask them if I say to you, Doctor Phil, "Oh my gosh, what are you eating? That's disgusting. Go over there and eat that." Am I being rude and mean, or am I being a bully? And kids will say I'm being a bully, and I say, "No, no." 
if I'm, if it's constant though, if I keep picking on you and I'm picking on you for some reason and, but everybody else I'm nice to, so it's targeted, that's bullying. So getting kids to understand that. And then we list off every mean behavior that we can think of. And do you know, a lot of these behaviors, kids don't even realize are bullying, like, you know, embarrassing someone in front of their class, correcting someone, the eye roll, whispering in front of. That is a really disrespectful behavior. So we start listing them. And then the teachers, the feedback that we're getting is once kids understand what types of behaviors are, are could be considered bullying, um, that helps a lot. But dealing with an aggressive bully, someone that wants to physically hit you, um, the best advice that we have is keep a mean kid more than two arm lengths away so they can't hit you or push you. Use your voice to attract attention. Make sure your hands are up so people can see that. Uh, no pointing or this because that's, you know, fight. This is a girl fight. And a tr noise attracts attention. And that actually happened to me in high school. And I used that and it worked. I had six girls try to jump me when I was a senior in high school. And I wasn't even in the martial arts. You know, I strive to eat healthy every day. Sometimes it's not so easy. That's why I would like to introduce Happy Viking, the protein and superfoods powder created by Venus Williams. Now, proper nutrition is important to me. And each two-scoop serving is packed with 20 grams of plant protein, one full cup of fruits and vegetables, and the benefits of more than 60 superfoods, vitamins, and minerals. Happy Viking is a great afternoon shake that is easy to make, and it's delicious. It helps boost lean muscle, sustained energy, digestive health, brain power, and immune support. You get to choose from six delicious flavors. No gritty or chalky taste like other protein powders. Yuck. Happy Viking Protein and Superfoods Powder, made by tennis champion Venus Williams, is hands down the best tasting plant protein powder out there. So visit drinkhappyviking.com and use code PHIL, P H I L, for 20% off your first purchase. That's 20% off at drinkhappyviking.com with code PHIL, P H I L. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're not, podcast. Not saying that join our cult i mean community i mean the coven religion okay, let's just stick with community listen to the podcast listen to the podcast <laughs> chief david brown july 6th of 2016 you were a dallas police chief july 7th 2016 you became america's police chief now, you became chief in 2010 yes right? yes in 2010 and you had just been in that job for weeks when you lost your son yes my son was uh, 27 years old, uh, living on his own, and he had been experiencing, I'm finding this out after the fact, experiencing bipolar, schizophrenic, adult onset behavior, right. hearing voices. Uh, he and his girlfriend had uh, tried to get help. He didn't like the medication. He told her not to talk to me, not to tell me about it. He was embarrassed about his mental health. Um, I was unawares. Um, he has a psychotic episode. He ex he's experimenting with uh, marijuana that's laced uh, with uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And he gets a gun and just starts shooting. He's shot and killed by police, uh, and an officer is killed in this horrific shootout in a suburb of Dallas. And I'm in the job just a few weeks. Burying a child is... Bad enough. But the circumstances that that happened was just over-the-top grief. So he shot and killed one of your officers? A, a suburban cop. Right. Yeah. And then he was killed yes. by an officer. Yes. And he was mentally ill. Yes. I mean, it's a perfect storm. Police, it's like, it's like a family. So you grieving twofold. You, you, you're grieving for the loss of your child and you're grieving for the loss of a police brother. 
and there, there's people talk about you know what, what do you say? No, nothing you can say to it's it's a grief and a pain that's dark and deep. It, it really is, and it's uh, but for my faith in Christ that I'm able to even talk about it. And I think it's important for me to talk about it. It's, it, it's therapy for me. I've talked about it on more than one occasion. Uh, but the despair and, and, and the, 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 just the, lo- the sense of loss, it, it, it's, it's, and I know you talk to a lot of people that's lost people that they love. It's a big hole that never gets filled. It, there, there's time doesn't help. People tell you, you know, just give it some time. Time doesn't help. Uh, it, it's, it's just the burdens we bear uh, that in this life. And you just have to take a step and then take another. And I got back to work as chief after two weeks off, Dr. Phil, and the, the criticisms were brutal, were brutal. Um, the, the cops feel a sense of, you know, your son's a cop killer. That's the worst of the worst thing you could be. Uh, and, you know, politicians do their thing, you know, trying to figure out which way the wind is blowing. Uh, I will say uh, the, the, the person that hires, the city manager for my government in Dallas. And so the city manager hires the police chief, uh, not the mayor or city council members. And city manager Mary Soon never wavered in her support for me during that time. She, she, she really was uh, more than stand-up. You know, can't find the words to say, even to this day, how much I appreciate how Mary uh, stood by me and helped me continue to lead the department. Well, I know Mary, and she is deep resolve. Yes, very much so. Yeah. You also lost a partner. Best friend. We hit it off. Like first day in the police academy, uh, Walter Williams, uh, he was 42 when he went through the academy. He had been, he served 20 years in the military. Oh, wow. And he wanted to be a police officer. He's 42 and I'm 22. And I'm thinking at the time, old man, I call him old man the whole time. I, I rib him the whole time. Old man, we run. He, he, he could run as uh, a mile as fast as I could. We were doing six minute miles, five minute, five. 25 miles, and I, this old man, I said, old man, slow down. You'll have a heart attack. I, old man, old man. So we get assigned to the same area of town. So we work partners. Um, and we're five years into the job, and uh, we both uh, take a test to, to, for our first promotion. I make detective, and I'm transferred. He makes field trainer, so he becomes a field trainer. And uh, my... One of my last conversations with him before he shot and killed on a domestic violence call is, man, why do you want to train rookies, man? They just going to get you hurt. They do stupid stuff. They make mistakes. I said, come on, apply for the detective. I was going to have a, put a good word in for him. He said, no, no, no. We're, we're here to help other officers learn how to do the job, David. I, I, I'll never forget that last conversation. I said, man, you gonna, you, I said these rookies, they're going to do, you, you're going to have you fighting people and they just do stupid stuff. Rookies make mistakes. He was determined to, to, to give back and teach rookies how to, do the, how to do the job right. And he always wanted to be police chief. I said, okay, well, I'll be, uh, I'll help you, but I, you know, I said, I can't deal with policy. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to be police chief one day. I said, man, God bless you. I said, I just, that's, that's not for me. <laughs> I said, I, said, I, I want to make more money. I want to get promoted right for my family, but I'm just going to go through the ranks and take the test. And when... The last rank you can get by taking a test, that's the last one I want. Uh, that was kind of our secret. And I'll be a, you know, whatever, captain or whatever for you, and I'll make sure we make you look good, brother. I said, but I want no part of dealing with politicians. No, that had to be a terrible loss. Oh, my God. I, you know, I couldn't go to the hospital when he was shot. He, he, he didn't die immediately. And his, his wife at the time told me, could I go home to their home and just sit with their kids. And he had three kids. And uh, I, I was 26 at the time and sat up all night with his son and daughter 
and young and young uh, teenager and a young a young child, trying to give them hope that he might pull through, and he and he passed away that night, and I grew up that day. I I went from twenty six to about forty six. And of course, you did become chief in, in 2010, and obviously, you got white officers, Hispanic officers, right, right. black officers. Right. 20 reporters needing a story every day. Yeah. <laughs> Always looking for something, right? Every day. And you did a lot of controversial things. I did. But one of the things you were always very outspoken about was reducing police violence. Yes. Which it seems a bit of a contradiction because your favorite thing was SWAT. Yes. <laughs> and you came from SWAT. And I, I've got friends on Dallas SWAT, and they they have T-shirts that say, you can run, but you'll just die tired. <laughs> I mean, it's like they get called when things get bad, right? That's right. And I have a lot of that in me. At the same time, it, it's in contrast to this, uh, this is a profession. And people in this city expect us to uh, protect them. But you did things like fighting drug dealers. You would just park a cop on the corner where the drug dealers made their living and just park them there yeah. till it just dried up and they went away. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't everybody do that? It makes the police officer visible. It drives the drug yeah. dealers out. And I know they say they're they just going to move to Somewhere another else. corner, but then yeah. so can you. Right, exactly. I, you know, I try to do it some worked. things. Common sense ain't so common in a lot of professions. And ours is no exception. Law enforcement, no exception. So I, I did some very uh, kind of common sense things that you would think yeah. uh, most people would try. And, and some people do. I, I don't want to uh, right. put out that I'm – smarter than everybody else in the profession. That's not the case at all, actually. I made a lot of mistakes uh, in the profession. Uh, but I, I really tried to engage the community in ways when there wasn't a crisis that, that built some currency when I thought we would need it later and when we did have a, a yeah. mistake or something that happened. I really tried to do things that built relationships. And, and, and it was in contrast to uh, let's arrest them all and let God sort them out. Because um, that, I have a lot of that in me too. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm thankful that the part of me that really wants to build relationships wins a lot of arguments. Yeah. You have this multiracial department yes. that you're running as a black police chief. How much did your 11-year-old friend <laughs> have to do with where you wound up being colorblind? Everything. It's amazing. Talk about that. It's amazing. Every time I talk about that, I, I, I'm amazed at, at this story. So I'm in the first group of kids in the Dallas Independent School District that are bust during desegregation in 1971. I'm in sixth grade. And I'm going to an all-black elementary school in sixth grade. And uh, Judge Barefoot Sanders orders Dallas Independent School District to desegregate the school. And... Overnight, the next school year, instead of the, the school I used to walk to, I'm bused on the other side of town to Mark Twain Elementary, an all-white school, uh, just a handful of blacks. And uh, Dr. Phil, I'm not exaggerating. No one spoke to me for three months. Seriously? I'm walking in the hallways like I'm invisible. No one spoke to me for three months. And uh, I hate it. I hate going to school. I'm, it's starting to shape my view of whites. I, I, I hadn't grown up around whites, and my school had all black teachers. So this is my experiment, experience for three months, that no one's speaking to me. I raise my hand to answer a question the teacher never calls on. Um, none of the white kids speak to me. And one day I'm walking out of the school to get on the bus to go home. Uh, the most popular white kid in school, his name is Mike Schillenberg. Uh, says, hey, David, you want to come to my house for dinner? Just out of the blue. Knew my name. First person that spoke to me. I stop. The bus takes off. I turn around. And let me, let me try to describe Mike Schillenberg. Mike Schillenberg is a sixth grade, 11-year-old Brad Pitt looking guy. I mean, he's, all the guys look up to him in sixth grade, and all the girls love Mike Schillenberg. 
popular, good looking, blonde hair, blue eye. I mean, just the you know, picture perfect. And I turned, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's going to turn down Brad Pitt for, for dinner? So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going, you know. And so, Load me up. Huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 let's go, let's go. And we, we walk, and I'm walking with it, and I'm thinking, first thing I'm thinking is, at 11-year-old, man, white people should eat dinner early. Because it's like 3 <laughs> yeah. o'clock, and my mom ain't going to cook till 7. So that's the first thing, is that, is that dinner going to be ready when you get on, Mike. And, and we walk in. His mother calls him to the kitchen. He hadn't told her he was going to invite me over for dinner. And they're going back and forth, whispering in the kitchen about this. And I, I don't, I'm sitting on the plastic furniture. You know how they wrap pa- the furniture in plastic in the 70s. And I'm thinking, man, I'm about to get uninvited to dinner. I'm so I feel like Sidney Poitier, but I'm about to walk out the front door. I said, man, I'm not going to be embarrassed and get kicked out of the house. So, but, but before I got to the door, his mom comes out with two pot pies. And we sit down. And, and Dr. Phil, I'm not exaggerating. You would thought we'd known each other our whole lives. We are like two people. We, we, we talk. All evening, we play outside. We lose track of time. It's starting to get dark. I miss my bus. My mom doesn't know anything about this, and so you know, Mike's mom got to take me home and uh, to the hood <laughs> at dark. She ducking down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fastest driving white woman I ever seen. Yeah, she's like she drive NASCAR. But we get home, and my mom has uh, convened a search party to look for me. <laughs> Because she thinks the clan had got me and I'm like, you know, ditch about to die or something. Right. And, and she turns around and hugs me, kisses me, asks me, uh, where the hell you been? And I point toward Mike's mom's car behind me and she speeds off in a dust of smoke. <laughs> it goes where the car had been. It's funny as hell. And uh, Mike changed my view of race forever. Forever. Mm-hmm. Just, just, just with that invitation. Just and y'all remain friends. From we're, we're best friends to this day. Really? To Best this friend. day? Yes. What's he Stayed do? He's a banker in Dallas. Really? Yeah. He, he, he went to the University of Texas, like me. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never get sucked into first being a victim because you, 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 you're not going to treat me second class. You're just not going to do it. Or, you know, having someone else feel the same way because they wasn't raised right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I need to teach you a little bit about brothers. Well, isn't it something how that happened when you're 11 years old and it influences who you are as a police chief in one of the biggest cities in America? Yes, especially through crisis moments. That, 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 that having that lens yeah. of a, a, a young white person treating me with respect uh, is revealed uh, during crisis moments much more than any other time. Do you have a strategy, a philosophy for school shootings? Should there be Mm. armed guards at the schools? Should the teachers be armed? Should, what is the solution? How do we combat this? I've I've been discussing this with a couple of uh, independent school district police chiefs recently. So I, Got a lot of information about this. It's it's multifaceted solution, more than one solution. Number one, we need to put the money into bulletproof glass for our classrooms, including the doors, uh, and make those safe rooms that you just can't shoot through. We need to have uh, limited access to our schools. Our schools have 20, 30 doors where you can come off the street and walk in anywhere you need to have limited access to our schools. Uh, we need to have a, a system to communicate to the staff when we have an incident. In many of our school shootings, one area of the school didn't even know what was happening compared to the other side of the school. The, the, the old intercom system just is not 21st century solution to this complex problem. You know, when we had the intercom system, they never would imagine school shootings when that was created. Uh, next is. Uh, a touchy subject, but I've mentioned it before. Uh, we need to be able, to, through primary care for our young people, identify mental health and have access to quality mental health for our young people. Not that mental health equals school shooting. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, saying early identification uh, can uh, lead to mitigating 
it evolving to a violent circumstance. Dr. Phil here. Come February 27th, you're going to be able to pick up a book called We've Got Issues, and you know we do. This is a book that says it's going to teach you how to stand strong for America's soul and sanity. And in this book, I set forth 10 principles for saving this society from going off the deep end. 10 principles for protecting your family. 10 principles for giving you what you need to flourish and have the life that you want for yourself and for your children and for your grandchildren. We've taken some wrong turns. We've been letting the loudest voices dictate some of the thinking that has taken us way off course. Well, I'm speaking up and bringing us back to the center of the road. I hope you'll pick this book up and I hope you'll read it with a real open mind because I'm pushing back against a lot of what you've been hearing. Somebody had to do it. Might as well be me. February 27th, we've got issues. I'm here with Joseph Raymond Lucero. He is an actor. He is a lot of different things, but he grew up on the mean streets. And when I say mean streets, I'm talking about he is a third generation gang member whose parents, brothers, uncles were all in the life, struggled with heroin addiction. And Joseph was in trouble with the law at the ripe age of nine years old, was in youth detention, spent 12 of his first 26 years in the California State Penitentiary. And his son was born while he was in state prison. And that was a life-changing event for him. When was the first time you were actually involved directly with a gang? I want to say about 10 or 11. We started off uh, skateboarding. We called ourselves Team Tiny. Myself, uh, Michael Nillis, Travis Seaman, um, Tyson Haynor. And that was turned out to be my homeboy Trippy. My homeboy Smokey, my homeboy Silent. We went from being skaters to pretty much getting jumped all the time by all the gangs around. We finally said, F it. You know what I mean? We started our own gang. And when that happened, there was only like five or six of us. And now there's, I mean, there's hundreds of them. You know what I mean? And it's still a going concern. It's still a going concern. Yeah. I, I walked away from that years ago. Yeah. You know? When you say you were getting jumped a lot by, gangs, what does that mean? You would be in, in their neighborhood. How did you intersect with these guys? To and from school. You know, you come across anybody that, you know, where are you from, homie? You know what I mean? And basically, if you're not from your neighborhood, you're going to, you're susceptible to an ass whooping, if not a shooting or a stabbing. Mm -hmm. At that time, we were still fighting, even though the guns were, they, they, they were, they were there. You know what I mean? Um, to and from school, you would have shootouts. So I mean, sometimes we did school. And we couldn't tell you why we did school. I mean, you, know, you didn't want to come to school. It was hard to get to school sometimes. How old were you when you first carried a weapon? I was 13 years old. And uh, I remember my father, my stepfather, and I don't use that term a lot because he's not my biological father, but he was the father that that accepted me and was there for me, you know. Um, and he was fully in that, engulfed in that but he did change his life at the end of his life because he ended up dying of pancreatic cancer and when i say he taught me certain things on how to induct myself as a young gang member he knew the right way if, if that's even proper to say because there's no promotion from my end for the gangs but he wanted me to live it the right way you know very contradictive you know don't hurt women or children but if that's the opposition across the table, then you do what you need to do to make sure that we stand we stand tall always. Um, I bring a gun home, and my dad slapped the shit out of me. And I remember crying and him saying to me, what's going to happen when six dudes run up on you and jump you? I'm going to fight. I'm going to scrap. Take an ass whooping. Shut up. And he slapped me again. You're lying to me. You're going to pull that gun out, and you're going to shoot. 
And then you're going to do something that you're never going to forgive yourself for and you're never going to be able to take back. You're going to take somebody's life and you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. And that was the first time in my life that I had really understood maybe how important or what guns could really do. Because here's somebody that I looked up to and wanted to be like, and he's shooting that, that down, that avenue down for me. And all my homeboys had guns. And he taught me the fighting. You know, you... There's, you know, he just taught me certain things to be a proper gang member. And I hate to use that because there's nothing proper or right about being a gang member. But there is a culture and there are mores and folkways within the gang. They have a protocol. They have a code of conduct within the gangs, right? Yes, sir. And that's what he was teaching you. Yes, sir. So you didn't run afoul of that and disrespect somebody without realizing what disrespect look like or what behaviors would be interpreted that way yeah and then the consequences to fall that you know what i mean i wasn't aware of those things this was the first time i got the tattoo i got san diego on the back of my neck he wanted to slap the shit out of me again san diego was big you don't own san diego what the hell did you do to to put that city on the back of your neck and i remember thinking i thought i was cool i got san diego i'm tattooed like my dad i'm getting closer to being like the man that that i want to be that's just that doesn't see me as his son or whatever the case may be, I thought I was becoming more like him because I was becoming more of a cholo and I was, I was putting in work. I was getting the tattoos. I was trying to be like him. I thought that's what I had to do to, to earn that love. And I got another school that on tattoos. You earn those. You don't just put them on. Lames put them on. You're not a lame, son. And what's a lame? In his way, a lame would be somebody that is doing the gang stuff for all the wrong reasons and has all the bad schooling techniques on how to be a gang member. If you're going to be a gang member, do it right. It's very contradictive. We don't hurt women or children. We do what we do, and the opposition knows that they're the opposition and we're their opposition. So there's an understanding between the two of us. So 13 was the first time you carried a gun, and he didn't much like it. So did you put the gun down for a while and then start carrying again? Did you stay armed during your time when you were in the gangs? At different times I did, and at different times I didn't because I, always in the back of my head I knew. I didn't want to kill anybody. Even in, I would picture scenarios were going to happen, and I would have these flashes, and I knew in my heart that I wasn't a killer. I knew in my heart that I never wanted to take anybody's life. And I started to carry a gun less and less. You know what I mean? And it didn't take away from my loyalty to my homeboys in representing, but I was an educated one too. And I was taught from the older ones that I wasn't just somebody that just jumped when they said jump, that I had some sort of brain power and that was able to strate uh, strategize certain situations. And I had no idea, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to please the next person so I can get some fulfillment of the void that I'm missing in my chest. Whatever it takes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill it up. I've heard you say that when these young guys are talking about the loyalty and the pride and the support within the gangs, that that may be misplaced, but that it's very real. That when they feel the sense of belongingness and the sense of loyalty and support to the gang, that it's a real thing. There really is a bond there. 1,000%. I can only speak from, from my experiences, Dr. Phil, and it was the hardest thing. It's, it's, it's one of the insecurities that still comes up today that I feel that I betrayed them. Some of them were my best friends. We did all the wrong, all the wrong things, but I thought for all the right reasons to stay connected and to have that love. And that's why I believe I'm here with you. You know, I have to make amends for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Like, there's some people I'll never be able to say sorry to, and I wish I could, man. And it makes me want to cry right now. I, I won't be able to. But that's okay because I'm on this path, you know? Um, the love is real because when you don't know love and you find acceptance, that's love. It may be chaotic, but it's love. And when you find that, you don't want to let that go. I heard you say on one of your, your, I've been listening to your podcast and I love the me because only me, I have control of me. 
But I caught a glimpse when we were talking about one of our past uh, guests and just the beginning stages of reaching out and that acceptance of being and the baby knowing that that's, that's my nurture right there. That's the one I can trust to love to. I didn't find that. My mama loved me and I knew that, but I found that even more on the street because my mom's always going back to prison. My dad's always going back to prison. So it was on their terms to love me. In the streets, it was on my terms. It was on my terms with my homeboys. I was able to show them love that not even the police could take. Give me 20 years, I'll never tell. I'll do the time. I'll put in the work because I built that. Nobody could take that away but me, but me. That was my purpose for so many years, but I was just angry, resentful, insecure. I felt abandoned and I didn't know which way or how to run, but that love, man, that love was real. So you're not getting it at home. Then you go out and you bond with these guys and it's like, we're all in this together. It's a brotherhood and to that death. feels real. That It was real. It, it was real. It, as we say it right now, I still feel it. Not the loyalty to it, but that it's real because some of them are dead. Some of them are in the bay. Some of them are doing the rest of their lives and never able to come home because of what we believed in and what we started. And I wish they, I wish they could find something that, and know even in there, if they have to stay in there for the rest of their lives, that they're worthy to change. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I still feel that, that loyalty to help them grow because what I feel, Dr. Phil, this, I feel alive. I haven't felt alive like, the last five years, I've been more alive in my life. This month is like, I've been on your show six times, man. You have went out, you have went out of your way to want me on your show. My insecurities run rapid. How does Dr. Phil want me, Joseph Lucero? Why would you want me after all I've done? You know, and then I shut those, those down because I have healed that. But I have to embrace that. And I talk to my sponsor and I let the ones that I trust. And I know that these, these little, that, that I'm hitting with these demons again, that they're, they're coming up because they, they're questioning it. Because I'm a self-sabotager. I get in my own way because I'm insecure sometimes. But that's the old me. Now I have people to, to have that support and hopefully work through that. But do you give yourself credit? Like you and I've worked together, as you say, a half a dozen times with young men that were really on the precipice. They were on the edge of the cliff. And I mean, I've seen you come and just really give from the heart, really dig for these kids that you didn't know until you got here and make a huge monumental difference in their lives. Are you able to give yourself credit for that? Yes, in the sense of that I, I connected with them on their terms, not on mine, I found similarities. And to see the joy just, just a little bit, you know what I mean? Gabe rapping, Jason being able to go on his trip with his mom. Yeah. I still communicate with Chaz. This morning, he's all over my, all over my social media because mm-hmm. he wants to call out this kid. And I simply hit him back with, no, nah, it's, hey, it's not about judging, baby boy. It's, we have to have the patience. It's not about the hood. It's about the pain in our chest. And four comments, back, 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 back. His last one was, you're right, big bro. Hands, praying hands up, change is possible. And that reinforces that I'm doing, and I feel good about that because the young man started hostile. Mm-hmm. Wants to judge this man. You the same kid. You young, <laughs> Bieber looking. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? But you have pain in your chest that nobody can, can contest that. And that's real. So that's all I wanted to tap into. I just find the similarities that I had as a kid. Does it feel strange to you that everybody around here on the Dr. Phil team has embraced you the way they have? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Every time I walk in, I I just smile. Like, everybody's smiling. Like, I'm just like... And then the moment you told, you know, me that you wanted me back that when my son was here... That's monumental for my son. Like that alone, you, his life I've been doing, we've been doing this, but then somebody of your stature saying, I would like you to meet with so-and-so and and figure out something for this or that, for the future, whatnot. And that was just so beautiful. My son seeing that. And I was just like, my son's telling me, yeah, pop, it's because of what, how you talk to us. Same way you talk to my friends, the same way you embrace that kid. 
And my son, like who I left the first six years, five, eight, five years, five years, eight months of his life and abandoned him and his mother and why I went to prison because I thought I was the tough guy, you know, and had to leave her out there to raise him. And now we've built that, that, that relationship. Yeah. I talked to him that day, aside from you a bit, he's very proud of everything you've done and are doing. He was proud of you here that day. He's proud of his dad and you're <laughs> proud of him. I know. Oh man. Now, let me ask you something. People wonder about this. You see the gangs, and you said it's different now where they, you call it post up on the streets. They spend a lot of time on the street hanging out. Are they doing drug deals? What are they doing on the streets? I mean, it's to each their own as far as the gangs. Every gang, every neighborhood has their own set of bylaws. They have their own cultural influences within every single neighborhood. So whatever has been passed down from the generation prior is usually what is running their train of thought and their belief system in the present. And that could be whatever, kids coming from prison, bringing prison politics. Maybe they're just drug dealers and just want to get money to get out of the neighborhood because you hear a lot of that too. And they're like, I just want out of the neighborhood. That's all you know how. I've gone into some of these neighborhoods when I was a case manager for Homeboy Industries and I got three and four year olds that can spell out gang signs with their fingers, but cannot write letters or numbers on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And that will not say any C words when they're speaking to me or not say any B words when they're speaking to me. And that would blow me away, but it gives you a glimpse into not just their parents and their home life, but the community as well. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because that love is real. It becomes bad when we start to promote the gang violence and we start to commit crimes and we start to victimize those around us and we start to just have no respect for law and rights of others. That's what needs to be addressed and stopped. But that's not going to stop until I believe it's a mental health issue with our youth, with our adults. And if we understood what the, where the pain came from, these kids could take that as a class younger than young, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And be able to embrace that. They would get fundamental skills, fundamental daily skills, moment by moment skills, which I think are more important than two plus two right about now because the way our youth is just running from us. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, it, it's sad. Like I, it breaks my heart. I'm so blessed to be in my kid's life. My kids have both their parents. It breaks my heart. These other kids and my daughter be friends and they don't have that. And you want to just, you want to coddle them. You want to do more. You want it like, it's like, you just want to help because kids shouldn't hurt. Dr. Phil, right? They, they shouldn't. I'm representing change. I'm trying to heal, trying to plant seeds and, and instill self-worth. I want people to find joy in life. And that's totally against what, you know, we represented before. If we've got people listening to this right now, whether they're, Young people that are thinking it's the cool, badass thing to do to get in a gang, or we've got parents whose kids are starting to dress like a gangbanger and starting to walk and talk and kind of take on the persona and are flirting with that life. What do you say to them? I'd say to the kid or the parent? The kid. It's not necessarily what I would say. It's, it's we get to know him. You got to spend a day with a kid like that unless, you know, I got this sheet run, spread out for me the way you do it. So that's one thing, like, it's beautiful that you're able to do. When you have it cold and raw, you just have to listen. For me, I listen. And I will find a few things of similarities between us. And that's what lets me know the kid's pain or whatnot. And then I'm able to hopefully connect on that pain to where he'll give me some sort of ear just a little bit so I can hit him with something. For me, it's getting that, building that relationship to hopefully they, when I do hit them, that they're more, they'll be more receptive that rather than resistant because they're already resistant. Everybody's judging them. They're scared. They're apprehensive. Walls up. Why would I bring it down? You know what I mean? And I know that and I accept that. So I have to be ready for that. So I try to just listen. Pastor James Ward says that the core conviction to overcome is the first step to shifting from victim 
to zero victim thinking. So we're going to talk about Pastor James' book, Zero Victim, Overcoming Injustice with a New Attitude, and ways we can get out of victimhood. And when I say get out of victimhood, it really is an escape because this can be a prison that we get caught in in our lives. It can be a way of looking at things. It can be a lifestyle. It can be an attitude of approach to how we live our lives. I think Pastor James has really identified something that I think can be outcome determinative in a person's life. Your book couldn't be more timely. Congratulations on an excellent book, by the way. But what caused you to write this particular book, Pastor? Well, it's it's really um, something that sprang from my own life. You know, just the backstory. I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in the in the South. And um, doctor, there was just an understanding, a uh, nonverbal understanding that uh, black people and white people didn't get along. Um, that was the culture there. And that was further uh, clarified by the fact geographically that Tuscaloosa, my hometown, is divided by the Black Warrior River. And it was like the white folks were on the north side <laughs> of the town and the black people were on the south side. And you just didn't cross the river. Um, I remember going into third grade um, at the tail end of integration when uh, we got the news that we were going to be bused to the white side of town. I really don't recall um, in my mind seeing a white student. Um, a few teachers at our black school uh, were white, but I really don't recall seeing a white student until I was bused to the north side uh, to go to school. On the way to the north side, uh, you cross the river. There's a geography change. I noticed that the homes were uh, very well, uh, the lawns were very well manicured. The hedges were trimmed. Um, the streets were clean. Just a different world. And something on the inside of me initially said, I, I belong on this, on this side of town. <laughs> you know, it's like your outsides. You know, I'm liking are, this. <laughs> yeah, your outsides are catching up with, with your insides, you know, which uh, has a lot to do even with victim, victim thinking being perpetuated, just environment. But once we get to the new school, the chalkboards are nice and clean. The, 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 the building is well lit, fresh paint. All the playground equipment worked. But on the inside, I was saying, you know what, there's going to be some racial problems because black kids and white kids aren't supposed to interact. I had a great teacher who was um, happened to be a friend of my grandmother's, uh, a Southern, Southern uh, AME pastor. She was the wife of, of a Southern pastor. And she happened to be my third grade teacher, but she was um, the most refined, uh, stately black woman I'd ever met. And she would do something that was revolutionary. She would put our names on the board whenever we did well in class, not for punitive reasons, but whenever we did well, she would put our names up. I noticed that my name was on the board quite often and something was happening on the inside of me. And, and really by Providence in third grade, I, it hit me that the white kids around me weren't against me and they weren't keeping me from doing well in school. And from that point, the seed was planted in my mind that I didn't believe in white supremacy because I didn't believe in black inferiority. I understood in third grade that um, intrinsic worth, uh, knowing my identity, knowing what I was capable of, um, I could not be robbed of that because of the perceptions of the people that were around me. Now that was the seed and that really began to kind of shape my life and I experienced what I call zero victim relationships all throughout my life, healthy, quality relationships with people of all ethnicities. And, um, you know, a few years later, many years later, as a matter of fact, I was working at a, at a church in the South suburbs, which is a church I pastor now. And we took um, uh, an attitudinal assessment. And in that attitudinal assessment, one of the categories, it graded the degree to which you saw yourself as a victim. My score comes back as zero. And uh, eventually the guy who facilitated the, uh, the, the assessment said, you know, I need to talk. I've never seen anybody score zero in the area of victim thinking. Where did that come from? How, how did you approach uh, life? You know, what is your thinking? And I explained to him what happened to me in third grade when I was really liberated and freed from understanding and believing that the people around me could marginalize my life. Now, that's not to say that we don't have a number of challenges in our society and broken systems. Of course we do. Broken, broken people create broken systems, but not being a victim of the system and knowing that 
um, the things that are in me, what God has placed in me, who I am, those are much, much more powerful forces than the opposition that comes against me. And I think that's the the premise of zero victim mindset. Imagine what people could do in life if they did not believe that they were victims. Of course, things happen, but, you know. Well, of course. And let me ask you about that. You said you didn't believe in white supremacy because you didn't believe in black inferiority. Yep. Do you think you have to have one in order to have the other? Do you think that the black man, the black woman, the black child has to be instilled with a feeling of inferiority for white supremacy to reign? You have you have to buy in at some point. And, I, and I'm not saying that there are not legitimate instances of um, folks that you interact with that communicate that, or sometimes you're in a situation where there are inequities in terms of power and privilege and those kinds of things. Absolutely. But you have to participate. At some point, you've got to believe it and embrace it for it to be operative in your life. I would tell our church for years, I don't know who the grand dragon or the grand wizard of the KKK is. I don't know who he is, the the highest guy. I love him. Now, he has problems. He has a number of different things that he needs to work out in his life. But as far as James Ward, I love him. I care about him. I have empathy because of the problematic thoughts and sentiments that he has. There's something greater in me. The love of God in me is greater than the hatred in him. I would never allow him to be in power over me for his hatred for me to undermine my love for him. That's the power of zero victim thinking. That kind of thinking that you're describing would go a long way to getting the divisiveness in this country to narrow, to bring people to a willingness to start talking to people that have a different position on some of these core issues right now. Because right now, we're seeing people that disagree with us as the enemy. Not just somebody that disagrees with us, but the enemy. And enemies are people that we see as attacking us, taking advantage of us, doing bad things to us. And there's no way you can do that unless you see yourself as being under attack. I think it's terrible that we've gotten to the point where we really do see anybody that disagrees with us as an enemy. And I know people say, oh, this is the worst it's ever been in America. They forget about the Civil War. <laughs> you know, it seemed <laughs> yeah. like things got a little bit worse then. I was around when we had the demonstrations against Vietnam, and I think we were as close to this country melting down then probably as we've ever been. So there have been other times, and we seem to have come out the other side of that, maybe better, at least okay. But I don't know that we've put on our victim hats and painted our counterparts as enemy as much as we do now. I think what you're saying is really important to say, let's just, let's talk this through. Let's, let's really share. And it goes back to what we started talking about. We need stronger people where we don't have to feel so threatened every step of the way. And, and there's, a, there's a greater tragedy, Dr. Phil. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Civil War. Um, there's another spiritual principle. When I talk about spiritual and moral law, Jesus says this, a house divided against itself, it won't stand. And at some point, we have to recognize that the division in our nation will eventually become an irreversible problem, a greater problem that now we're talking about the the essence of our nation now can, can implode. I'm talking about our nation can literally implode if we don't get a grip on the division that's taking place. And zero victim thinking neutralizes that so that we can at least be civil and respectful and intelligent about our dis- discourse to respond by reason to these challenges. I have no doubt in my mind that we are sensible and intelligent enough to solve every problem we're dealing with in America. I just I don't believe that we're some kind of specimens in a in a in a test lab to just react to whatever happens in life. God created us in his image to be very intelligent. I think we're we're more than capable of solving the issues that we need to in life. But again, there's such an emotional, visceral reaction that's being monetized, weaponized, politicized. Who's who's gaining from the division in our society? That's another question that has to be asked. But I I think there's no there's no question at all 
that we can address these issues if we can ever sit down from a zero victim perspective. You used to be able to have a debate and then walk off the Senate floor and go have lunch with your adversary and come back. And the comment I get now is, well, if it's all the same to you, I don't want to go have lunch with a baby killer. Well, okay, I understand, but let's find maybe a place to start. (laughs) We don't have to go there on the first sandwich. Let's let's find a place to at least treat each other with dignity and respect. And maybe we can find something that we can both live with. Looking at this from a psychological standpoint, if we look at violence, for example, You go into a neighborhood in Chicago, L.A., New York, or whatever, and they'll say, well, you know, they're violent neighborhoods. You can identify neighborhoods where the violence is located, but research tells us that within that neighborhood, there are locations within a neighborhood where most of the violence is centered. You can go into a few city blocks and you can find portions of blocks where there are micro locations and you can identify sometimes what you can count on both hands where the perpetrators for 80 or 90 percent of the violence are among bad actors you can count on both hands. It might be six, eight, ten people in a micro-focused area within a neighborhood. That means if the right people, the police officers, the social workers, the parole officers, the probation officers, can get this mentality and sit down with those young men, and they are men, and they are young, and they are identifiable. We know who they are. We know who's doing what they're doing. And get this across to them that they do have a choice and that it's them that needs to take off the glasses that see the world in this way. Significant changes can be made with a relatively small number of people in every community. That's correct. Because we know who they are, we know where they are, and you're talking about a mindset they need to embrace. And if they will, then the whole tenor of the neighborhood can change. I've seen it when we take them out and we incarcerate them, but they tend to come back or somebody tends to come up in their place. But if instead of doing that, you change their leadership, you change their influence, then you can change the tenor of the whole neighborhood. And and doctor, I'll add one more component to that, which I'm the greatest advocate for family. I, I take tremendous pride and esteem in being a father. So in that same scenario that you're communicating, And maybe this is a completely different show. We have to talk about the role of the family and the role of fathers in the home and fathers having a zero victim mindset to to teach their children. It's really amazing that the Bible, even though women carry the baby and nurture the baby, the Bible, the Bible tells fathers to raise your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and don't exasperate them. Don't provoke them to wrath. It was God intended for the fathers to be the educator and to define in the home. And so another missing conversation with victim thinking and the challenges that we're seeing in our in our society is we're not really addressing the role and the importance of of fathers and building strong families. Now, the second the second part of that, when we talk about, you know, just the 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 attitude, the overall attitude of victim victim thinking, um, we travel, we get to travel the nation and, you know, even internationally quite a bit. I get to meet people from all over America, and I'm amazed at the common denominators of of decency, living a good life, a quality life, that most people in America want the exact same thing. And when you talk about those micro pockets, those, uh, you know, those those small areas where you're seeing trouble come from those areas, I think the same thing is happening in our nation with the division that 
it's not widespread across the nation. The nation is not as divided as we're being you know, taught and told that it really is. Most people, I think, have unified, unified around the common denominators, good old-fashioned life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I, I, my, my one criticism of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, I said he got the order wrong. Instead of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, it should be liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and life. I think everything starts with being free. And once you are free, you are now free. You have the liberty for the pursuit of happiness. And as you pursue happiness in life, it creates a life for you. That's the power of zero victim thinking, that any person who is subject to victim thinking, you don't have a life. You're not free. You're not able to pursue your goals, your calling. You lose the dignity of, of being who God created you to be, to give your best, to be your best, not only for yourself and your family, but for your community. Don't deprive the world of the greatness and the great potential that is inside you because you're living subject to victim thinking. I really want to see uh, a mass liberation take place and see this broken over our nation. I think it'll, it'll lead us to a place that we'll all benefit in, in ways that we've never, we've never imagined before. Some people take the straight path in life, but at Arizona State University, we respect your twists and turns. They make our online students more driven to excel in their professional lives. That's why our personalized suite of services empowers you with innovative resources and staff that sticks with you. Make your next turn with one of our 300-plus programs at ASU, number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Visit us at asuonline.asu.edu to learn more.